Hey, Al Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. Oops. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. All right, there we go. Do we have you? Abner, welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, I'm sorry. Please uh, pronounce your last name for me so I don't get it wrong here. Yeah, it's uh, Gvaryahu. Gvaryahu. Okay, great. So, okay, I got it. Gavar Yahoo. All right, so welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Uh, the website is breakingthesilence.org.il, and the project is about Protective Edge, the war last summer against Gaza. And you guys have testimonies from uh, how many 60-something soldiers, and it's sort of it's like the winter soldier testimonies uh, from Vietnam and from the Iraq War, everybody, where these uh, members of the IDF talk about the real war as they witnessed it, and in a way that, uh, you know, might tend to ta- cast a little bit of doubt on all those slogans about the IDF being the most moral army in the world. Uh, but uh, so how many was it? 60? Uh, how many soldiers here that you got? Yeah, so it was actually 70, a little, um, um, a little bit less than 70 soldiers. Mm-hmm. About uh, a third of them were officers, um, which is... Uh, Something which is uh, uh, pretty unique for these kinds of uh, reports. We've been around as an organization for over a decade now, so we really started uh, working around the the end of the Second Intifada, uh, um, which was around the, the year 2000, um, and the organization started in 2004. So we're really uh, um, this June will be our 11th year. Um, and we've been uh, um, documenting um, the Israeli occupation from uh, the perspective of uh, the occupier, if you'd like, um, for, for all this time. Um, all our work is done um, 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 by former soldiers. So I myself was actually a paratrooper. Um, and alongside with me in the organization, there's uh, people that served in different infantry units and, and different battalions. And we all uh, uh, came together in order to, um, you know, break our silence around this uh, too long military occupation. Um, and that's what we're basically here to do. All right. So now how difficult was it for you to find soldiers who were willing to talk about what happened last summer? Well, it, it, it definitely wasn't uh, uh, an easy task. And right after the, Operation was over. Uh, we realized that it's uh, it's uh, part of our duty, um, and we understood as an organization it's part of our duty to get um, um, you know a different perspective from the soldiers who were there, out there. Um, and we, um, you know, I would say it, it sort of happened in the same time that we started reaching out to people and people started uh, um, contacting us. As I said, because we've been around for, for a while now, um, we actually met throughout the 11 years we've been around, we met close to a thousand soldiers. Um, um, so when we, when we, you know, put our heads together and said, okay, how are we going to get the soldiers who were serving, who just finished serving? So of course, the natural thing was to turn to soldiers that have already given testimonies. And that was really the beginning of the process. But there were also uh, soldiers that uh, uh, turned to us. A, a part, a big part of our work is, is educational work. So uh, maybe the, and this is throughout the year. You know, the heart of our work is really gathering testimonies. But we also spend a lot of our efforts educating whoever is really interested to hear about what we what we heard. So a lot of the people that we met throughout the years um, um, that later on joined the military. Um, after serving in Gaza, uh, turned to us. Um, so it's sort of a combination of us reaching out and, and people, uh, um, and many soldiers actually felt that there was an urgency, uh, to, to, to contact us. 
Um, and, and I think that explains the, the, the high numbers and that explains the, the large number of, uh, of officers as well. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, this is just an assumption, but I guess your critics must say that, well, you're cherry picking. You're finding a couple of guys who are willing to say what you want to hear. But what about the rest of the soldiers? Wouldn't they discredit this and say, no way, we only ever kill bad guys, et cetera? Well, well, I, I would, I would say that. I mean, I, um, I, I don't, th- I don't think uh, that that cl- that claim is, uh, um, you know, really uh, um, credible. But I mean, I, I would say that what what we really managed to, to, to show is is the tip of the iceberg, um, and and I definitely think that, um, uh, you know, um, I can't say everyone agrees with us, but there's definitely many people that that understand that. We're really only showing the tip of the iceberg, but um, I mean, what 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 we're really trying to do, and this is a big part of, and, and it's not an easy task, but we really find it important to, to 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 express the fact that we're not we're not an organization that's trying to show, you know, the the, the IDF horror picture show. You know, we're not about showing uh, um, the rotten apples. We're about showing the norms, and and this this has been our mantra, um, you know, constantly. Uh, you know, we we all, we're always we're always about talking about a system and not about individuals. But I think this time around, this operation, it was so clear that the the the, the soldiers that chose to speak with us were really just, um, you know. Uh, um, 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 you know, share, share, sharing with us um, their orders, and I think that in in, in that matter, the the, the soldiers that we met um, were really uh, doing exactly what they were asked to be told. Uh, and I think um, this time around, more than others, the, the claims that we maybe found a few, uh, if you'd like, rotten apples. Um, you know, just doesn't uh, compute with uh, the testimonies, which which constantly go back up to the chain of command and talk about rules of engagement and talk about massive usage of artillery and talk about um, you know um, massive areas of killing zones and and th- these these are things that can only come from the top. Um, so w- w- there are specific incidences that are that's really that that shout out, but those incidences only talk about the system, and I think that's that's really where we're trying to put our focus. Mm-hmm. Okay, well now, um, so do us a favor then. Go through, I guess, if you could, please start with those rules of engagement. Uh, some of this sounds like the Vietnam War, um, where if it, this is an area where no one is supposed to be. So if they're here, they must be guilty of something. They count as Viet Cong, basically. Go ahead and get them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I would, I would just say, I mean, I don't know enough about Vietnam. I, I mean, I do know a lot about the various op- operations and, and wars that Israel took part in. So, um, I'll, I'll leave you with the comparison, which is fine. I would say that when I think and when I compare this, this operation in Gaza to other operations in Gaza or in the West Bank, we see that we have definitely dramatically changed the way that uh, uh, we're fighting um, um, the Palestinians in Gaza um, or Palestinian um, um, guerrilla or terrorist groups in, in, in Gaza. You're saying and, there's and an I, official I, change in the rules of engagement. Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a, uh, a change that we can really start um, dating it back to um, the end of uh, the Second Intifada, which as I mentioned, was around the year 2000, and definitely something that we see very dramatically um, is the change after the Second Lebanese War, which was around uh, 2006. Mm-hmm. And and um, I'll give you just a small example, and I think this will really relate to the areas that I mentioned or that, or that you mentioned, the, 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 the areas where basically anyone in them was seen um, as an enemy, um, and this is maybe one of the biggest changes we see in the past 10 years, which is um, artillery. Um, for many years, and, and, this is, and this has really been the reality in the West Bank and in Gaza, and, and 
we definitely don't have enough time to go back into the whole history of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the Israeli occupation. But we really saw both the West Bank and Gaza as areas that um, are populated with civilians and that we have to uh, uh, deal with uh, resistance from within these uh, in environments. In 2005, when Israel disengages from Gaza, uh, we see a very, very dramatic change. Um, and, and one of the interesting um, quotations is really around that time, a parliament member from Meretz, which is um, the Isra- one of the Israeli parties, which is uh, one of the more liberal left-wing parties, uh, but the parliament, parliament member himself was actually a very high-ranking officer in the artillery uh, brigade in, in, in his military service. And after 2005, for the first time, does Israel actually point uh, artillery um, towards the Gaza Strip? Now, for, for our listeners who, who aren't aware with our, uh, what artillery means, I actually, I was a, uh, an infantry soldier or a paratrooper, so I act, act to learn a little bit about artillery. Artillery is a, a, a very inaccurate weapon. It's basically a weapon that you're only supposed to use in a, you know, full on war, army against army. And even then it's very problematic. It becomes extremely problematic when you use this kind of weaponry inside uh, one of the most populated areas in the world, which is the Gaza Strip. Um, and, and this parliament member, once uh, these artillery cannons were pointed on Gaza around 2005, he says, you're basically um, 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 forcing our soldiers to act in an immoral way. Because basically using artillery means that you know for a fact that you're not going to have any accurate hits. Um, and, a, a, and a shell, an explosive shell of artillery, every point it hits kills everyone in the radius of 50 meters around it and injures everyone in the radius of 150 meters around it, right? When we talk about artillery shells that were shot in this last operation, we're talking about close to 20,000 that were these kinds of shells. Just in comparison, the last time around in Protective Edge, which was a similar operation, Israel shoots much less, only 3,000 of these kinds of weapons. So we definitely see a massive change and the only way we are we allow ourselves to actually shoot this kind of weapon is because we declare very big areas inside the Gaza Strip as war zones. We take populated neighborhoods um, and we declare these areas as war zones. We throw pamphlets from the air um, and a few hours afterwards, we start bombarding the area with artillery. And the soldiers basically enter an area that in their mindset, because there was uh, the pamphlets and they it's already after artillery. And in Hebrew, when we talk about artillery, we basically the the military term is to soften, to soften the area before the troops come in. So we basically soften this area with thousands of artillery shells and soldiers enter these neighborhoods in the pretense that they're entering an area that have no civilians in it. And when you read the testimonies of the soldiers, and I and I recommend everyone to find, the very, very easy to find on our website, the soldiers over and over again talk about the fact that there are no civilians in these areas, or that they're, they're told, sorry, that they're told that there are no civilians in these areas, and that because there are no civilians there, any person they see they can basically shoot to kill. Right, now, so- contra to what, con- I'll just finish, contra to what they were told, right? And this was basically a point which we feel soldiers were basically lied to. So I don't think the soldiers were victims here, but definitely they were lied to because they were told that they're entering areas that there are no, uh, uh, there are no civilians there. And when soldiers talk to us, over and over and over again, we hear stories of soldiers entering houses in these areas that were already bombarded, right, where soldiers are shooting in every direction, where you have tanks shooting to every place that seems suspicious. And in, inside these neighborhoods, 
Soldiers enter houses, sometimes 30, 40 people are there. Women are walking back to their homes to get medicine. Old men, and we have a story, an incident of an old man that was shot and killed. Because in these areas, the pretense was you have no civilians, which factually was just not true. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's the same premise of from Vietnam, that free fire zone or Fallujah in 2004 for, is another good example of that same policy where we just insist there couldn't possibly be civilians. Anyone that you see is a combatant, so treat them as such, even if you can tell with your own lion eyes that it's clearly not a combatant. You go ahead and kill them anyway. That's the, the policy. And now you mentioned how, how there was a big change after Lebanon in 2006. Did these guys talk about the Daia doctrine, um, which was named after a neighborhood in Lebanon where Supposedly, the IDF learned the lesson that it's a good thing sometimes to just raise a whole neighborhood to the ground, and we'll call it the Daia doctrine now. Yeah, I mean that that that's a that's a, a very good point, which we definitely put an emphasis on in our analysis as an organization. So we really see the the, the Dahia as, as a, um, we, we call it the Dahia doctrine, the Dahia doctrine as as also a, as as as, a, as one of those uh, um, changes. That uh, really has has brought us to this point, and as as you mentioned, really this this neighborhood in in, in Beirut, which uh, uh, was basically destroyed to the ground, um, um, and 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 this actually became it. May, maybe Beirut was 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 um, 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 one, one of those points where we really implemented it, but it was a doctrine that that officers were taught in officer school for a while. But actually, our current chief of staff, Gadi Eisenkot. Is, is sort of like the, the poster boy of the Dachia doctrine. And he was quoted saying, you know, if there'll be a house that shoots at us from a village, the entire village will be destroyed or something along those lines, where the idea is a non-proportionate or a disproportionate response to any aggression. <clears throat> and, and, and I think that the, the, the mindset of this doctrine is because, um, uh, um, we're in this sort of reality where it's not, Tank against tank, or or plane against plane, but it's a, a, a very strong military. In this case, Israel versus uh, smaller guerrilla groups. We're never going to have a clear victory. So the only thing we can do is make sure that the next round will be uh, uh, um, in the in, in the latest latest uh, time as possible. So the stronger blow we give our enemy, the longer it will take him. To actually, uh, um, you know, reboot or and then retaliate. Now, when when you when you understand that this is the mindset, I think you understand Gaza, because you know there was definitely, and this, you know, I'm, I'm saying this is and this is, <clears throat> I think, an important point. There was definitely uh, a real threat on uh, villages in the southern border of Israel. There was definitely. <clears throat> Sorry, there was definitely a threat, um, of course, by the missiles or by attack tunnels, um, and, and there was a, a real feeling of fear. And as and as, as an Israeli, this is something I can relate to. But um, I think that we also have the responsibility to talk about, you know, the the tools that we are using in order to deal with these threats. And I feel that was totally lacking from the discourse around this last uh, Gaza war where we definitely, without any doubt, used a disproportionate amount of power. And, you know, I mentioned uh, um, artillery before. I think artillery is uh, definitely one of the best uh, examples of this massive use use of power. I mean, alongside um, um, almost 35,000 artillery shells, 19,000 of, the, of them were the explosive shells, but 35,000 altogether of artillery shells. We have um, close to 20,000 tank shells which are shot. We have uh, close to 5,000 um, um, airborne uh, Air Force missions. Um, and, you know, this is part of the reason that we see this massive, massive destruction. And when you listen to the testimonies of the soldiers, you realize that uh, in many cases, the fire was not... Uh, a shot in order to protect uh, soldiers or to protect civilians, but actually to create a massive uh, damage. 
Um, and it's not only with artillery, but it's also with the tank shells. Uh, one of the testimonies we get, we, we got this from a soldier during his second day in the Gaza Strip. He's, uh, uh sort of the, the northern, uh, part of, uh, cent- c- center, uh, center north of the Gaza Strip, <coughs> where he's, uh, uh, they're actually, uh, wake up in the morning, their commander asked them all the tanks to go up in a, to form a row, seven tanks, and to, uh, um, aim into a neighborhood called El Bourej, um, and without any reason, they weren't shot at. They didn't see anyone in the distance. They do what what he calls "Good morning, El Bourej," and they basically uh, all the seven tanks shoot into random houses into El Bourej. Now, El Bourej was um, <clears throat> three kilometers away of where these tanks were, right? But this story is actually not unique when you hear the other tankers, when you hear the other soldiers on the ground. There was constant fire, and this constant fire. Uh, was uh, part of the mindset of the, um, definitely part of the mindset of the Dachia doctrine. All right, now let me ask you this, Abner. Um, what can you tell me, what have you learned about the attacks on the safe zones? Because as you said, uh, you know, the, the safe zones basically are what's left when you have to flee from what's now become a free fire zone. They say when they f- drop the flyers, you're not safe here, go there, and you'll be safe there. And so all the civilians flee there. And then, as they were complaining at the time, uh, they get bombed when they went to the safe zone, just as well as in the free fire zone. And then, I guess as a corollary to that same question would be, um, what about the attacks on the U.N. schools? I mean, they kept claiming, well, it's just an accident, but they kept bombing U.N. schools full of refugees. Did you have testimony um, that sheds any light on what was going on there? Yeah, I do. I actually have to say that I think that, um, that, that, and this we heard over and over again from soldiers, there were points and there were places, um, outside of, uh, um, if you'd like the, 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 the fire zones or these combat zones where, uh, soldiers were ordered, do not shoot, uh, schools, do not shoot UN, uh, um, um, buildings and, and so on and so forth. And I think, and I, and I, and I think I can't say this for a fact because I, we really don't have accounts of each and every one of, of the missions, but I think it would be fair to say that, um, every time, um, a school or a UN building was hit, it actually was, um, by accident. Now, uh, but I'm saying that with a grain of salt because one of the interesting testimonies that we got and this is actually also in the booklet, was uh, from a soldier that was in charge of, was, a, was an officer in um, one of the artillery corps. And he actually describes um, um, one of the debriefings that he got. And in the debriefing, they, you know, the, the artillery, which is always a little bit in the, in, the, in the leg, a little bit in the back of the infantry and the tanks, or a little bit deeper inside the, the area or specifically here in, in the strip, the artillery are always in the back and they don't have a good picture of what's happening in the front. And they always feel that they're not giving enough protection to the soldiers. And in this, in this briefing, um, they, the, a few of the officers talk about the fact that they feel that they're not really giving so, the soldiers on the ground enough protection. And one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, most high-ranking officers in that room actually calls a bunch of them up, and when the debriefing ends, he tells them something along the lines of, "Listen, guys, there's a trick." And he explains to them, "This is what we did in Lebanon," and he describes a reality where you have a target with, that you want to shoot on, right? It could be. Um, and this is, again, depends on the time of the operation, and we hear different things from different soldiers, but it could be, you know, a Hamas gunman, and it could be someone just looking on the roof. It depends. Both scenarios could be seen as a threat. But even if you see, let's say, a, a gunman and he's shooting the troops, um, Hamas gunman shooting, shooting the IDF troops, um, and in his perimeter... Right. Let's say 200 meters from him, there is an, a UN school. The rules of the artillery are you're not allowed to shoot 
the gunman, if it, if he's too close to a school, and if you'll actually point, put into the GPS that specific point that you want to shoot in, you won't get permission. So this high ranking officer says, I have a trick for you guys. The point that you ask for shouldn't be 200 meters away from, uh, um, from, from the school. It should actually be 400 meters from the school. So you double the distance. Now, artillery is a very inaccurate weapon. So this officer says, after you ask for 400 meters, the only thing you have to do is turn your barrel 200 meters to the right. So to make a long story short, I really don't think, and this is again from our testimonies, that there wasn't a deliberate attempt to hit schools. But, and this is a very important but, there definitely was also... There were definitely also cases that we know of or that we know that potentially happened that we did not do whatever we can to make sure we wouldn't hit schools. And this is contrary to what we said. Mm -hmm. Um, Another. I'm sorry, but what about the contradiction between, hey, run here to the safe zone and then people getting bombed in the safe zones? Was that overblown or was there a reason for that? Do you know? Yeah. So so I think one, one of the things we hear, and this is also something that was a lot in the media, is um, what was called the knock on the roof. Maybe you, maybe you heard of this, uh, practice. Uh-huh. Knock on the roof basically, uh, was, 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 uh, at least this is what we were, we were uh, told in the Israeli media. This is sort of a way, uh, to protect Palestinians living in, uh, who are in houses, right? We'll have this small missile that will not, you know, that will hit the roof and then people inside the house will know that there'll be a, a, f- a few moments later, right? There'll be a bigger bomb that will come and destroy the house. And this was, sort of sold to the Israeli public. I don't know how, to, how it was seen around the world, but definitely sold to the Israeli public as sort of a humanitarian uh, action because this way we save lives. And I think one of the examples to show how this is absurd, this idea, is that um, we hear from, we meet soldiers that were actually uh, not on the ground, but were in what are called attack cells. You know, the, the, the soldiers are sitting inside the war rooms and giving the, okay for the Air Force. And these attack cells get multiple uh, perspectives. It could be intelligence. It could be information from the ground. It could be information from the air. And they eventually have to make up their mind and say, is it okay to attack this house or this individual? And one of the things that we hear, for example, is that um, most of the Air Force attacks or strikes were actually deeper into the into the strip. So not inside the areas that the soldiers were at, but actually inside the place that we told Palestinians that they should be evicted to, right? So, for example, we know that Palestinians were evicted from the neighborhood of Bet Lahia or Bet Hanun and were told to go into the refugee camp of Jabalia or to the city of Jabalia. But we also know that there were airstrikes inside Jabalia. So one of the things we hear from these attack cells um, about this knock on the roof is that um, in many cases, there were these knock on the roof, but um, sometimes there was half a minute or a minute from the knock on the roof to the actual bomb. And the testifier, the soldier, tells us maybe, uh, uh, you know, a Hamas member or Islamic Jihad member is fast enough to run in this split second and to go into a tunnel. But the grandmother on the fifth floor, the fourth floor, she won't make it. Right. So this is one. What, what, one understanding why there were these civilian, civilian casualties. Another understanding that we get is that the IDF actually does have the c- capacity to know um, uh, in accuracy how many people are in each house. We don't know how. We're not exactly sure what the methods are, but we hear this from soldiers. And we also know that this, me- that this method was not always carried out. So... For example, if you have an airstrike that you want to carry out in Jabalia, which is a neighborhood that you evicted Palestinians into, right? And you now have this knock on the roof, right? And you only have an idea of how many people are in the house because your intelligence is pretty uh, old. It could be a month old, two months old, sometimes a year old. So you, it says in, on your, in, in your information, it says in this house, you have 20 people living. But now you just had entire neighborhoods flee into Jabalia. So maybe each house has double the number. 
This is information the Air Force doesn't have. So I, I think it's much more about the fact that we are now in, uh, uh, you know, the way we conduct our wars with in Gaza is that we will, um, um, you know, it's 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 not it's not the, uh, um, um, and I really think this is true. I don't think that soldiers, and this is from meeting many soldiers and reading the testimonies, soldiers did not uh, wake up in the morning with the urge to kill as many Palestinians as possible. I think this was not the case. But I think that there definitely was, in many cases, indiscriminate fire. And I think that there were, in many cases, uh, realities where we did not do whatever we can in order to save innocent lives. And I think in the end of the day, when we look at the numbers, if we look at the numbers of, uh, you know, the innocent civilians who were killed, we look at the numbers of the children that were killed, um, I, I, I really don't think that uh, um, there was, you know, like, like we hear in, 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 in various wars or specifically like Vietnam, you know, let's, uh, uh, the, the death toll. And I don't think that was the case, but I do think that there was a, um, um, a disproportionate use of power and, um, um, and definitely this idea that we will do, uh, whatever we need, many times not asking ourselves, um, or not asking ourselves a moral questions in order to uh, protect the soldiers, um, also at the expense of, um, of, uh, of uh, innocent Palestinians. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it seems, again, like you're talking about with the free fire zones and this kind of thing, uh, and, and we see this, you know, from a lot of different wars, where uh, enemy gets defined down and rationalizations, you know, get stretched in order to include people who are killed. We see this with the drone strike, too, where if they kill the fighting aged male with a drone, well, he must have had it coming unless you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt he was innocent after he's dead anyway. And it doesn't matter. And that's, yeah. you know, and they call that the, the just laws of war, too. But. Yeah, there, there, there's actually uh, uh, one of the testimonies, which I think is really along those lines, is a is a story in, in the south part of the Gaza Strip of uh, two women that are walking, you know, between um, 500 meters, 700 meters from from the troops. So they're definitely not at risk. And our, our, our testifier tells us this whole story where it's noon and they see these two women and there's uh, some sort of fear. Maybe they're lookouts or maybe you know they're in this zone so they uh, go up to their commander on the radio and the commander um, orders an airstrike and the airstrike um, kills these two women now the, the guy who, who, who talks to us he says I, I felt this is bullshit so he actually makes a point to to, 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 to to know what what they found on these two women so they you know there's two tanks that go up and and check what these two women have on them. And they don't find anything on these women, not a weapon or, or, or even a walkie talkie. And they, they don't, they find two cell phones on them. And, and the testifier says it, you know, it's a joke. Who doesn't walk around today with a cell phone? So he goes eventually to the, to the, what is called like the war room where they write down all the information about people who were killed and, 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 you know, an enemy that, that was successfully uh, uh, stopped or destroyed or or whatnot, and and he 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 realizes that these two women are actually written down as uh, terrorists, even though nothing was found on them. Um, and and this is something that we hear more and more: this idea of how we we took this what used to be this idea of targeted assassination, where you have a a specific individual and you build a whole profile on him, and mm-hmm. you know he's this this extre- this 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 uh, 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 you know the the biggest bad guy and that you can find, and 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 then you assassinate him. I, and, and we hear this from other soldiers as well, is that we basically took this idea and turned it on the head. We turned it on the head. We kill someone, and like you said, later on we build the entire file. Right now, so for Americans, we live in a big old country here. I live in Texas, and it's a big old country all by itself. But could you explain to people in a way where you think they might be able to really get their head around just what the Gaza Strip even is, how big it is, how many people are crammed in there, and just what a canned hunt this entire exercise is in terms of who versus who? Yeah, so, so when we're talking about uh, the Gaza Strip, we're talking about a one of the most dense, densely populated areas in the world. 
um, in, in an area which is extremely, extremely small. Um, I, I can't, uh, sadly, I don't know what the best comparison in the U.S. would be, but we are talking about a very narrow strip. Uh, again, we use the metric system. I should have thought about that, but we're talking about um, uh, the length of um, a little bit more than 30 uh, kilometers, which is um, pretty short. Uh, you know, it's sort of uh, you can pass all the strip from north to south in uh, in about more or less half an hour, 40 minutes, um, and and the and the uh, and that's the the that's north to south. East to west, it's very, very narrow. We're talking about in some areas five kilometers, you know, which is a which is a, a five minute uh, five minute car ride, and in some areas which is a little bit wider, twelve kilometers. So we're talking about a very, very small area with about one point eight uh, million um, Palestinians, more or less. There's different numbers um, from uh, you know it depends who you ask and demographics is always a very politicized um, point 1.2 1.8 it really depends um, but there there are a variety of very important organizations both Israeli and Palestinians and international that deal with these issues and I think Gaza is, is a very important point I have to say that it, it's it's a uh, it's one of those topics which is that it, it, there's definitely not an, an easy solution on the table um, it's definitely one of those things that I feel that as Israelis, even Israelis who tend to support some sort of resolution or tend to support some sort of positive change, uh, are very confused about. Um, and, and, but, that, but, but, and, and for, for obvious reasons. I mean, it's, uh, I think that, uh, uh Hamas, uh, controlling the strip are not, not making the lives easier for, for, for Palestinians living there, definitely not making it easier for the for the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but um, I think that uh, w- you know, without diving into that whole issue, it's it's an it's it's something we can't ignore. And and I think that the way we we Israel and I, and I, you know when I talk about Israel, I talk about myself, even with the criticism I have to my military and the actions of my government. I talk about. Uh, um, you know, the change I want to see in my country, we, we can't ignore Gaza. Uh, we, we have to think of a different way uh, that we're going to be moving forward because the only thing that I can promise you without any doubt, and this is something that Israeli politicians for across the board will all agree upon, is that there is going to be another operation. There's going to be another war. Um, and the, the former chief of staff, um, um, who just spoke in, in the convention last week, he said the next round is going to be much worse. So everyone knows this is about to come, and the only way we know how to converse with our uh, with our neighbors, if we'd like it or not, is through the barrel of our gun, or 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 you know, or um, or with uh, um, bigger numbers of artillery. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do as an organization. And, and this is, you know, us as former Israelis, this is us, for, sorry, former soldiers and, and, and current Israelis that want to continue to live in this place is that we have to, you know, think of a different route. You know, we have to think of a different way that we can um, have some sort of relationship and move forward from these uh, terrible, terrible operations where, um you know, um, um, dozens of Israelis were killed, dozens of Israeli soldiers were killed, and thousands of Palestinians lost their lives. And, and this is just uh, um, something that we find to be uh, devastating. All right, everybody. That is Avner Gavaryahu. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I sure appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's very important work that you're doing there. That's uh, breakingthesilence.org.il. BreakingTheSilence.org.il and just go and read dozens and dozens and dozens of firsthand uh, winter soldier type testimonies from IDF uh, soldiers and officers who participated in the last war. We'll be right back. 
Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, Al Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co.